Welcome to to Zef, uh, and to uh, a happy event. It's always uh, good to get uh, a book done and out. I'm Joachim von Braun, and I welcome you to a book launch event on the book related to marginality, addressing the nexus of poverty, exclusion, and ecology. It's um, a book which uh, is truly selfish. It, uh, it's inter and transdisciplinary. It brings together ecologists, economists, psychologists, sociologists, and agronomists, etc. In addressing the question of uh, what uh, causes and what are cures related to marginality. The, the world wants to get ready for a new set of Millennium Development Goals post-2015. And poverty is at the top of the agenda. But what does this mean? And uh, how to move from uh, the current levels of poverty close to zero, as the World Bank and others have postulated. Our answer to that question is, it's going to be more difficult, but we shouldn't shy away from a zero of extreme poverty by 2025 20, or 2030. I would like to ask our speakers to briefly whet your appetite to read the book. And uh, we will not do a comprehensive preview or review of the book. There will be opportunities to ask a few questions and then we continue the discussion in the lobby over some snacks. That's how I understand the, uh, the setup is. I'm very pleased to uh, welcome uh, three co-authors of the book. Uh, there are many more. And I would like to give Hans Gatzweiler, co-editor of the book, the floor first. Please, Hans. Okay. Thank you, Joachim. Um, for the marginality book, I would like to identify five opportunities for agricultural development. And as you will see, maybe it is more than just agricultural development, but social ecological development. The opportunities actually arise from the frequently posed question, aren't the poor all, not always also the marginalized and vice versa? So uh, the, the answer to that question is clearly uh, no, not if we approach uh, the marginalized as we did so in our book. There are opportunities for a more differentiated and targeted and simultaneously comprehensive development approach when we look at the poor and marginalized from the lens of marginality. And the development policies resulting from that, or which are necessary from that, are more integrative and more inclusive. Opportunity one, addressing the needs of the poorest promises <coughs> returns. That means, for example, um, business opportunities at the bottom of the pyramid. Once an enabling environment and public infrastructure is in place, or also opportunities um, for the marginalized themselves, not only for the big business actors. And there are examples in the book in chapter 7, 16, and 20. Opportunity 2 refers to including the marginalized and investing in human capital stock for sustainable development. This refers to the idea of tapping unused human capabilities among the marginalized and poor. And as an example, again, we have chapters 9, 19 or 13 addressing these questions. Opportunity 3 refers to lifting constraints and creating additional spaces for economic activity and, and there, therewith also sources of revenue. We have chapters 18 and 21, for example, which relate to 
higher incomes, but also to the opportunity of collecting uh, taxes. Opportunity four relates to institutional opportunities, opportunities for institutional reforms by creating um, other types of spaces, referred, which I refer to here as freedom, uh, additional choice pos possibilities, and but also security. So from the opportunities to uh, reform institu current institutions, and change them to institutions which include the marginalized and poor, we simultaneously create um, a, a more mature civil society. And examples in the book are mainly in part five, which relate to responses to marginality at different levels from the state, business, and community. And finally, opportunity five, relates to realizing unused environmental potentials. This refers to making sustainable use of environmental services in marginal areas. We have an own part in the, in the book, Marginality, chapters, for example, chapters 10, 11, and 12, which refer to environmental dimensions and aspects of the marginality concept. In conclusion, Seeing the rural poor through the marginality perspective makes unused human capabilities but also agroecological potentials visible. It's worthwhile investing in marginalized areas and people. And the opportunity is not only for, there are opportunities not only for agricultural but also for socio-ecological development through discovering unused biophysical and sociocultural spaces through activating economic potentials, including integrating and connecting actors which are previously uh, or currently uh, excluded or in remote areas, and tapping unused human capabilities and agroecological uh, potentials. Thank you very much. Thank you, Franz. Uh, um, let me be a bit old-fashioned. Uh, this book is on the, on the internet. You don't need to buy it. It's not a book selling event. Uh, you don't need to touch this book, but I want to give you the opportunity to touch it, so I let it circulate. Uh, one from here and one from there. Uh, and uh, it's free downloadable. Uh, if you just Google Springer Publishers uh, Marginality, the front row and guts book, it will pop up and you got your book and uh, you send it out to your friends and uh, this way um, you make more friends in the fight against marginality. Uh, one aspect I would like to highlight, um, in addition to what Franz uh, in his uh, comprehensive <laughs> overview said, um, you will find an effort to map marginality in the book. Uh, comprehensive mapping uh, and where are they and who are they and uh, why are they to be called marginal. So this innovative mapping gives a lot of guidance to identify uh, options for demarginalization, de be it through technology, fighting discrimination and so on. So the different spheres of uh, uh, marginality creating factors uh, is, uh, I think, an additional important piece of information and research uh, in the book. Next, I would like to call on Akta Ahmed. Uh, Akta, you have uh, a great chapter in the book. Uh, please uh, tell us your part of the story, and then comes Asifa al Thank you, Franz. Uh, Actually, what I'm going to present uh, is first give an outline, I mean, just the uh, articles, what, uh, the articles that are included in the book. And I'm using uh, Professor Von Brown's presentation. Actually, it's not the book is free, but he also said in an email on the 23rd of October that, you know, to the authors that 
you go ahead and use this, uh, my presentation, you get that presentation at the World Bank. And so I'm using, you know, taking, I think I'm the first one who is uh, taking that offer. Oh, welcome. <laughs> okay. So um, the book has uh, five chapters, the overview concepts, and some of this actually uh, Franz, uh, he also mentioned. Uh, so uh, the second uh, chapter is on dimensions and prevalence of marginality, then environmental drivers of marginality, experiencing marginality in Africa and Asia, responses to marginality at different levels, state, business, and community. Now, each going more uh, the detail of each of these uh, uh, parts of the book is the first uh, article is marginality and overview of implications for policy. The second is marginality, a framework for analyzing causal complexities of uh, poverty. And then exclusion and initiatives to include revisiting basic economics to guide development practice, marginality from a socio-ecological perspective. In the second part of the book, mapping marginality hotspots, the poorest who and where they are, targeting the poorest and most vulnerable examples from Bangladesh, correlates of extreme poverty in rural Ethiopia, ex uh, examining the uh, circle of attachment trauma, shame, and marginalization, the unheard voices of young Kuchi girls. Third part, poverty, agriculture, and the environment, the case of Sub-Saharan Africa, the marginal poor and their dependence on ecosystem services, evidence from South Asia and Sub-Saharan <coughs> Africa, then land degradation, poverty, and marginality. Fourth part, tackling social exclusion and marginality for poverty reduction, Indian experiences, consumption behavior of the poorest and policy implications in Indonesia, addressing extreme poverty and marginality experiences in uh, rural China, and uh, experiences in targeting the poorest a case study from Bangladesh, rural poverty and marginalization in Ethiopia, a review of development interventions. Then the last part is responses to marginality at different levels, state, business, and community. Here we have five articles, macro, fiscal, and decentralization options to address marginality and reach the extremely poor, social protection, marginality, and extreme poverty, just give money to the poor. You know, very business approaches for reduction of extreme poverty and marginality, business initiative that overcome rural poverty and marginality through creating shared value. And finally, the marginalized and the poorest in different communities and settings of Ethiopia. So that's the long list of articles uh, contained in the book. Next is, uh, I'm going to highlight some of the findings of the chapter that uh, we uh, wrote uh, from IFPRI, and uh, myself and my two colleagues at IFPRI. So this is the poorest, who and where they are. So first, the poor, that is, those who are below, those who are earning less than $1.25 uh, per day. And this $1.25 per day is, uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, purchasing power, parity power uh, 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 dollar, which is uh, international you know, uh, exchange rate. And uh, so this, this rate is developed by IMF and World Bank. So you, we use that $1.25 a day uh, poverty line to estimate this uh, uh, you know, change over uh, these uh, years from 1990 to 
2008. Now, in 1990, there were uh, 1.9 billion people who were living less than $1.25 a day. In 2008, 41% reduction to 1.2 or 1.3 billion. And now the interesting thing is to see the composition of this change. What happened? In 1990, as you can see, Sub-Saharan Africa had only 15% of the world's poor. In 2008, their share has increased to 30%, double. On the other hand, uh, in East Asia and Pacific, their share in world poverty was 49% in 1990, and in 2008, their share reduced to only 22%. So, and this actually happened uh, mainly uh, due to poverty reduction in China, number one, and then also to uh, a, a, a quite a large extent in Vietnam, these two countries. But China was the driver of this uh, big reduction in the uh, East Asia and Pacific countries. South Asia, it was 32% in 1990. The share increased to 44%. OK, now what happened to the ultra poor? We divided this poverty into three. Uh, I mean, ultra poor and subjacent poor. Subjacent poor, we call them those who are just below the poverty line, that is $1.25 a day, to, I mean, from 63 cents to $1.25 a day. So that group who are just below the poverty line, we call them subjacent poor. Okay? And then those who are less than 63 cents uh, a day, that is half of dollar 25 a day so they are called ultra poor so in 2008 ultra poor were 234 million and 70 percent of the world's ultra poor they lived in sub-saharan africa and east asia and pacific has the lowest proportion of ultra poor uh, some countries like uh, China has no ultra poor in uh, 2008, and South Asia has about 15% of ultra poor. Now, here in this figure, we are showing that the rate of decline in poverty by these three groups, that is, $1.25 a day, subjacent poverty, were between 63 cents and $1.25 a day and ultra poverty who are below 63 cents. Now, here, what we are showing that the total decline was 21 percentage points from, 2000, uh, from 1990 to 2008. And for the subjacent and the ultra poverty group, we show uh, two uh, in comparison. The white bar shows if there was equitable growth, okay? Then what <coughs> reduction of, of uh, in poverty you would expect? And the black one is the actual reduction. So here you can see that uh, subjacent poverty has reduced by uh, 16 percentage point and, uh, and 16 percentage point what if you had equitable uh, distribution and the actual uh, reduction was 14 percent. For ultra poverty, which is quite encouraging to see that for the uh, ultra poor, their rate of decline was actually lower than what one would expect if income distribution was uh, equal. Okay. So this graph shows that uh, where in the countries where these uh, poor, those who are earning less than $1.25 a day, live. 78% of the world's poor live in 10 countries. And India, in India, 35% of 
passport they live in India, still 16% they live in China because just because of very large population in these two countries, right? So and you can see these uh, other countries where, like for example, Bangladesh uh, has 6% of uh, total uh, uh, poor. Now, you see, poverty is concentrated more in rural areas and 41% of all poor in the world, they live in India and China, rural India and rural China. 26% huh. in India and 15% in rural China. So that's my last slide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, well, the China story is certainly very important in the overall global context. We had a presentation here from the book author, Professor Zhu Ling, uh, a week ago, um, uh, who gave an update on uh, what happened to poverty and poverty reduction related policies in China. The Chinese government has decided to change what it calls poverty. The Chinese poverty line was at about uh, 60 cents, the ultra poverty line. And, uh, uh, that's no longer acceptable in China societally. And uh, so they increased their poverty cutoff point line to a dollar eighty, uh, which uh, by Chinese standards um, means uh, about 130 million poor people uh, in in China uh, by their domestic standards. So poverty lines are. Um, of course, also value judgment, what's acceptable. It's not just a survival line. Asefa. Asefa Admasi um, uh, from Ethiopia will um, talk about uh, the Africa and Ethiopia aspects of, uh, of the book. Please. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Joachim. Uh, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I think, uh, as, was, uh, uh, as it was alluded by uh, the previous speaker, uh, the book has uh, actually three chapters on Ethiopia. Uh, so I'm just fo focusing on the three chapters, uh, two of which uh, I'm a co-author. My other co-author is also in the room, so if you have questions, you have to send your questions to, this, to him, not to me. <laughs> uh, well, the... Uh, this project has been interesting uh, uh, for, for us, for Ethiopia, uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, and I think the stylized facts are, are clear why uh, you know, marginality, poverty uh, are very crucial for, for Ethiopia and Sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, uh, as you saw the previous picture, uh, poverty, the rate of poverty, uh, poor people, the number of poor people in, in Africa is probably uh, the highest in the world right now. I mean, of course, forget the sub sub-Indian continent. But in terms of in terms of number of poor people, uh, Africa has still a number of poor people. And so focusing on, on, on African issues is, is critical when it comes to poverty analysis or uh, marginality analysis or ultra poor uh, analysis. So uh, if we take the case of Ethiopia, well, uh, the case is very simple. Ethiopia, uh, the poverty has always been and is still uh, pervasive in Ethiopia. It's still uh, severe in Ethiopia. Uh, because many households are trapped uh, in, in persistent poverty and many of them are caught at the margin of cultural, social, economical or political uh, environmental systems. And uh, some of these you know, factors are very much related to household uh, related issues while some are related to you know, more external issues like the environment, like geography or uh, some of them are uh, probably related to the political environment uh, policies. So there are a number of interplay factors that have uh, uh, that have really uh, uh, marginalized people in many forms. And uh, in view of the situation, uh, uh, the the book and the project in general uh, uh, has uh, considered uh, Ethiopia as an important uh, study, uh, case study. And so uh, it was. Uh, very useful to understand the nature, uh, the nature of marginality in Ethiopia, uh, and uh, what are the policy responses 
to the issue of marginality in Ethiopia. So these were basically the kind of issues, the kind of research questions that we wanted to address uh, in, the, in this book. So uh, the book has three chapters on Ethiopia. Um, and the first chapter is, on, uh, is entitled, uh, as you saw earlier, uh, Correlates of Extreme Poverty in Rural Ethiopia. This uh, focuses on assessing the dimensions and the prevalence of, of marginality and, and uh, poverty in Ethiopia. Uh, using house, household level data from uh, national level data from the Central Statistics Agency and from the Ministry of Finance and Economic Development. And actually, uh, the, the, this, this uh, paper has attempted to examine you know, the, the determinants of extreme household poverty, ultra poverty, what, you know, what, which household level factors are important in, in, in discriminating between uh, you know, ultra poor and, uh, and other uh, levels of household. And the study focuses primarily on rural areas because poverty is by and large a rural phenomenon in Ethiopia. Well, uh, I'm not saying there, are, there isn't poverty in, in urban areas, but uh, the extent of poverty in rural areas is much more pronounced than, than what you can find in, in urban areas. And so the studies uh, focus, uh, this particular study focuses on, on rural Ethiopia. And uh, we've used three different measures. Uh, to, 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 to analyze, and uh, these are uh, the uh, uh, consumption expenditure measure, the dietary carbon intake uh, approach, and asset ownership. These were three measures that have been important to, to, to find out you know, who is really ultra poor and who is not. And of course, uh, I don't want to go into the econometrics. I mean, we have used some descriptive analysis as well as some you know, uh, binary uh, models to, to find out you know, uh, the determinants of extreme poverty, extreme uh, or extra, uh, ultra poor poverty level. And the result uh, shows that uh, uh, the ultra poverty is positively associated with a distance to all kinds of services, educational services, or services, health facilities, and other infrastructure uh, facilities. It is, uh, it is uh, positively related. And uh, you know, ultra poor households have lower dietary uh, calorie intake and they uh, own less assets, less assets in the form of livestock or farm assets for that matter. And uh, uh, the uh, ultra-poor uh, households uh, or ultra-poverty is positively and significantly related to the size of the household, the household uh, in particular. So uh, dependency is, is critical there. And, and finally, uh, you know, we've, we've observed that you know, marginality is not uh, you know, a random, uh, random, uh, random effect. It is visible in all, uh, you know, in all uh, regions of the country. So, uh, marginality. Uh, there is considerable marginality in in rural areas of the country right now. The second uh, chapter focuses on uh, on the poverty response. I mean, on the policy response. Uh, the title of the second uh, chapter is rural poverty and marginalization in Ethiopia: a review of development interventions. And this, has, uh, this, this chapter has attempted to explain the policy response to poverty reduction in general and marginality, marginality in particular, where you know, some marginalized groups, marginal areas are being selectively and specifically and particularly addressed. And so uh, the chapter has provided a comprehensive uh, overview of the policy interventions. And uh, sector-specific policy measures have been reviewed uh, exclusively. And uh, uh, in particular, the, the policy response that were targeted to vulnerable groups or uh, vulnerable uh, geographical areas have been in particular uh, emphasized uh, in this chapter. And uh, uh, in this respect, uh, it was very clear uh, to see that Ethiopia, at least over the last, let's say, two decades, 20 years, uh, formulated uh, a comprehensive development strategy that focused on you know, rural, rural areas in particular, and uh, it's called uh, the Agriculture Development led Industrialization, or we call it in short, AD ADLI, AD uh, And uh, this was actually implemented through a, a series of successive five-year development uh, programs, all of which have tried to uh, really capture uh, or emphasis uh, on marginal groups, marginalized groups, uh, as well as on marginal areas, like pastoralist areas, or uh, like marginal groups, you know, children, women, uh, and, and uh, disabled uh, uh, groups of society and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, in addition, there have been uh, several uh, uh, rural development programs, 
I'm sure some of you know about the Productive Safety Net program, which uh, targets uh, you know, uh, food security in, in, in targeted food insecure uh, districts of the country and food insecure households. Uh, there is also a food security program that has been running, and uh, education, health sector programs, and, uh, and other programs uh, have been implemented. And uh, poverty, at least according to the, to the official figures, uh, is declining. Uh, for a couple of years, uh, uh, something like uh, half of the population, uh, around 40, 40, 50 percent of the population was above the, I mean, uh, below the poverty line. Uh, but the current figure is about a third of the population, about 30% of the population is below the poverty line. So there has been a significant decline in the rate of poverty and obviously uh, the, the number of attractive households has also uh, considerably reduced because of the special policies and programs that have been targeted to the attractive uh, households and vulnerable areas. I think that's uh, what I have. I, I invite you to read uh, the chapters. Uh, more detail. Uh, well, the third one is uh, a chapter on the marginalized and poorest different communities and so settings in Ethiopia. Uh, this was more of a qualitative study, and uh, it's a qualitative case study, and it's, it has particularly focused on, on the variations uh, uh, in marginality between locations, between different uh, you know districts and, and uh, locations. And there, uh, the result shows that you know lack of many things, lack of uh, Credit, lack of water resources, lack of human capital resource, land degradation, and many other complex factors uh, play or interplay uh, in, in, in the process and, and uh, aggravate poverty in, in, this, uh, in this district. Uh, that's what I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Asifa. Uh, I actually see at least five other co-authors in the audience um, and uh, the applause for the speakers was also for them. Let me uh, highlight somewhat, uh, a somewhat cryptic cover of the book. What you see there, if you watch it carefully, is some circles. You see it? Uh, circles? Overlapping circles. Um, the, conceptual, the basic conceptual idea of the book is that uh, marginalized people are at the margins, at the borders of circles, say the circle of uh, uh, the economic sphere or the nutritional sphere. Rather than in the center, they are out there at the, at the borderline of the circles, the circle of rights. Yeah, they, they lack rights. Um, at the border of uh, uh, Geography, you know, they lack access to infrastructure. And unless we find ways to simultaneously move people from their border situation of these overlapping spheres and circles more to the center, we only selectively fight poverty and not sustainably. That's uh, the, the basic conceptual idea in the book, uh, uh, I think beautifully summarized in the, in the concept uh, chapter uh, by Franz Gatzweiler and colleagues.